Oh, it doesn't matter. Okay, so uh, let me introduce myself. My name is uh, Martin Povolny, and I'm of the, of the couple of uh, developers here who are working on, uh, on a many type U. Uh, well, we have a big goal. We would like to control all the things. <laughs> uh, I guess everyone here has, has come into contact with uh, some cloudy thing. Someone, well, the, the guy before me presented heat. Uh, I guess, uh, is there anyone he here who did not use uh, Amazon e EC2? Can you, can you give me your hands who has not used Amazon EC2? Okay. So most of you did. Uh, I guess uh, <laughs> there must be people here even who use VMware. Is there someone who uses VMware here? VMware. RevM. Great. OpenShift. Cool. So, so as you can imagine, there's really a bunch of things, those cloudy things, <laughs> in the infrastructure area or in the cloud area. And now we have even those uh, containers. And uh, well, it's, a, it's quite a bit of a mess. But well, you can find some common denominators. Uh, well, most of the things have something in common. Uh, and I would say that the most important thing that uh, in the end there's some user that, uh, that wants to uh, deliver some service. So the goal of our project is to, like, let's say, make sense of all of this and uh, make it easy for, uh, for uh, companies to deliver services uh, on top of all these technologies to their end users. So on the next slide. I would like you to show some of the some of the pieces of software that we already integrate in cloud forms. So, I have mentioned OpenStack. Uh, 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 you probably know that Red Hat has acqu uh, acquired Ansible <laughs> recently. So that's another piece of software that we integrate. Of course, VMware. Well, Red Hat is now friends with uh, with Microsoft, so we also integrate uh, my, uh, Windows Azure. We work with uh, SCVMM. Uh, we, have, uh, we have contribution from the community in, in the form of basic support for Google uh, Compute Engine. We have all, all weird, basically everything you, you can think of, we have it in uh, one form and, uh, or another in the product. So. so. Uh, as you can imagine, there's, uh, there are several roles that, uh, that uh, came into contact with our product. And each of, each of the roles has very, very different needs. Uh, so basically, let's say the most important uh, persona for us is, is the system admin that has to do the most stuff with, uh, uh, with, with our product. Well, system admin is responsible for things such as uh, resource management, configura configuration management, uh, then uh, capacity and utilization, has to, has to figure out if he has all the resources uh, that he needs, not only now and also tomorrow, has to plan resources, has to, has to check the um, capacity, has to track changes, has to analyze uh, has to, uh, deviations from the de desired state, such as uh, using our feature called drift analysis, has to, has to deal with uh, uh, multi-tier deployments, either using heat or using any other tool out there that allows you to uh, that allows, uh, allows you to do some orchestration and uh, of course uh, no one can understand all the different technologies uh, the differences between orchestration using ansible or uh, orchestration using uh, using heat or or using ec2 or w whatever other tool there is available so what we do is uh, try to abstract away these differences and provide, let's say, one way to deal with all of these things. Uh, so another type of user that we, that, we, that we have in the system is, of course, the end user. Uh, on the, let's say there's a sharp contrast between the end user and the system admin user, because the end user does not care at all about all of, the all of these details. Uh, the end user basically wants to get his uh, VM or environment uh, up and running or ha wants to have his application running. He does not care about any of the details. He does not care if he's running in a cloud or on-premise or if he's running in a container or, or in a VM or instance. He just wants to have the, his application up and running and wants to have it now. So end user would care about 
some, let's say, self-service with catalog of items that he can order, such as new development uh, machine with Postgre or, or Perl or um, new instance of machine that will, that will deliver some cashier software to people working at the, at the front office of, of, of a Benga or I don't know where, <laughs> anywhere, selling, selling terminals, stuff like that. And then we have, let's say, the third most important persona in our system. That would be the, that would be the management. And management would care about compliance with different policies. Well, you have, uh, you have policies dictated by the, by the country where you, where you do your business, such as European Union might have some regulations regarding uh, where the data is located, so, such as you can't take certain data to US because, well, we don't know what might happen there with the data. Uh, they care about also about planning because <laughs> they need to they need to plan what hardware to buy. They they care about about uh, reporting on the status of of uh, their uh, of their their stuff that they bought for their money. Uh, they they uh, need to plan expansion of their data centers. Uh, so they care about cap capacity and utilization too. They want to have fancy reports sent to them, create a cu custom reports that, that will show, for example, uh, for example, money spent in terms of computing time and storage, stuff like that. They want them delivered regularly for their meetings. So there is a completely different, uh, different set of uh, requirements that you have, uh, you, that you have for, for the uh, management persona. And ManishIQ tries to, tries to uh, let's say, satisfy all these needs by providing services, services in uh, four different areas. The first, uh, first, uh, first area is insight. Basically, you need to know what you have on your network or in your data center. You need to discover all your RAM machines, all your VMWares, all, all your uh, open stack uh, instances, all your open shifts and you need to track performance of those, stuff like that. So that's the, that's the area of, uh, of Manage IQ that is called inside. Once you, once you have all the data in the database, you know what you have, and you can, you can click on the relationship, uh, relationships between, between, uh, between things such as uh, where, we, where, uh, where a particular VM is running, on which uh, node in your cluster, and what snapshots are created for the VM, and what storage is connected, what networks that stuff is connected to, then, then you might want to uh, go a step further and use the control part of our product, where you can do all those funny things uh, with, uh, uh, with, uh, with security. You can check for, you can check for uh, updates. If you, if you have all your software updated in all your VMs, you can check if, your, if you comply with the rules that you have uh, encoded into the system, rules such as, uh, I said, the location of your data or uh, the rules might be, might be in a form of uh, policy that prohibits you of having uh, SSH, SSI, SSH uh, root access to machines uh, without, uh, without uh, with password, or you can you can uh, you can have a pos policy that a certain version of operating system is n is not allowed to be running somewhere, stuff like that. And once you have control, uh, well, you might want to automate everything. There was a presentation in the morning here showing how automation is uh, important in basically all areas. Uh, it's, it's important for, <laughs> for, uh, for, uh, for the repeatability of, uh, of uh, the operations that you do. Uh, it's important for saving time. So again, one of, one of the, one of the uh, let's say very frequently asked features of, of Manage IQ is the ability to to deliver stuff quickly, and that's done by automation. Uh, if you have, for example, if you are a bank and you you have some processes regarding regarding uh, regarding deployment of new machines, it, it might be a very long process from the from the initial uh, requirements that you form, let's say, as a development team of, of an internal application to the point where you actually get the resources that you want from your IT department. It, it may take weeks, it may take even, even months, and, and uh, with, with ManageIQ, <laughs> you can automate all that and get it down to hours or, 
or days dependent of, uh, depending on your, on your uh, processes. So, another important part of, of uh, managed IQs is, is the integration part. Obviously, uh, if you are a company with thousands of computers, you, you already have a bunch of systems running and you don't want to change everything just because you, you started using our product. Uh, on the contrary, you want our product to integrate with whatever you have. So, so uh, Manage IQ uh, offers a nice REST API that basically covers most of the stuff that you can do in the UI. It uh, has uh, many integration points where, where every, everything in Manage IQ is, uh, is built around uh, state machines and uh, those state machines can, can be customized, customized to include uh, steps to do integration with your systems, such as you might have some some IP address evidence system and during the provisioning of a VM you might want to, to let's say, record a new IP address to get together with some information in that, uh, in that system that you have. Or you might have, uh, you might have uh, your process management tool that you use internally to, let's say, do all the improvements. So you can hook, uh, hook that into the, uh, into the automation engine of Manage IQ and have, uh, have that integration uh, done and have your approvals done by your application that's also handling other kinds of uh, 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 improvements for you. So, let me show you what the application looks like. I will show, try to show it here. So this is, this is like the main screen of the application. As you can see, the menus are pretty complex. There's a lot of items everywhere. That's, 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 for the, that's for the sysadmin, sysadmin guy to find the sense in this. So this is not something you want to show to your end user for sure. Fortunately, fortunately you don't have to. So <laughs> uh, um, there's, a, there's a very strong capability in, in uh, Manage IQ that allows you to utilize, uh, utilize uh, access control to actually decide who can do what? So there's like a one dimension of, of permissions in the system that allows you to s specify what, what product features a particular role can use. So on the right side, you can see a tree corresponding to the menus. There, if you, if you click in that tree, you will see a bunch of very small features. So the granularity is very high that you can assign to a particular role. And then you can, you, you can use a system that we have uh, in, the, in the product that's called tagging. Basically, you can tag everything from a VM to snapshot or network, whatever. And you can do it, use it as a second dimension in the permission system, such as you can have a guy who will be able to administer all the stuff tagged as DB. And uh, he will only have access to infrastructure VMs. And that guy can be called DB admin. So he will have the he will have the ability to, for example, restore all the DB servers. And if you put that together with uh, automate from our product, you can have, for example, all the all the servers that happen to have uh, some DB server installed automatically tagged as tagged as uh, DB servers and have those permissions automatically applied. And the DB guy will will have his his access his access to the system. I will just quickly try to show you around some, some areas in the product. I have only like, how much time do I have? A couple of minutes, so I will try to so show something. So, as I said, the first, uh, first bit of the product is the, is the inside, so you can ac actually see the stuff that you have in the you are waiting for locals uh, that you have in the in the product, uh, and you can um, yeah, you can see the relationship between things. I would like to show that, but it's not showing, so I will show it here. So this is like the this is like the view at the details of a VM. On the left, you can see that we have discovered a bunch of stuff. We have discovered uh, an open stack and two revms clusters in different versions, and we have some VMware stuff like that. And on one of the Revams I'm showing a particular instance running, and you can see all the relationships and properties of of uh, of such uh, such a VM. So, if I would be, if I would click somewhere on the right, I could see the disks, or I, I can see attached storages, I can see attached networks, I can browse through snapshots created, etc., etc. 
So this is another view on the, on the same data, basically. And I will check if, if the application is actually working. Yeah, so it started working for me, so I can show it live here. So you see we have a list of VMs uh, that, we have, uh, that we have in the system, uh, not, depending on, not depending on the technology. And I can try again to click on something and see if we get, this is the stuff that's running under our vSphere, and if I select particular, particular bit, then I get the, all the details, and I can start clicking around, uh, looking at the cluster that it's running on, I can check the status of, uh, of that. So that's like part of the inside, and if I, if I would uh, quickly browse to other parts of the product, uh, then I can, for example, show you, show you automate customization that I spoke about. This is the place where you can, uh, where you can do all the speed ups by automating tasks. For example, here you can see a custom defined dialog that allows you to, to provision something in Microsoft Azure. Another way to customize our, uh, the product is by, for example, creating a report. There's a bunch of predefined reports for basically everything, and you can also, you can also create your own reports, and you can, if everything works, then you can even add, add different charts to those reports, so and you can have those reports sent to you, have them created on, on some schedule, uh, stuff like that. So, <laughs> so. Uh, so you might have noticed that the, the stuff is pretty complex, and uh, as I said, you probably don't want to show that to your, to, your, to your users. So we have also this. This is what we think that you should show to your users. This is like a shopping, shopping catalog where the end user ordering the services can actually, can actually order pre-configured items that uh, the system admin persona has created for him or her, and uh, this way, you can serve the staff, serve, serve the services of your IT department to your users. And you, as, as, you, as you see here, there's no notion of, uh, I don't know, cloud provider or, or uh, instance versus container, nothing like that. You are just, you are, as, as the end user, you are just ordering, ordering uh, some, some services. Well, these, are, these services are pretty technical, but well, you, you could have something like uh, account, accounting system in there or, or, or let's say a development environment with Perl or Postgre. And when you, when you click on such item, you fill in all the, uh, all the details that you, that you need to provision all the, all the things that are uh, needed to get the service running. Uh, it might be a multi-tier multi -tier stuff where you, where you need to spin like five, uh, five different VMs to actually get all the things uh, going. It might be just a simple container. Uh, as the end user, you don't care what, the, what it actually is, so you just care about uh, having, it, uh, having it available for you to use. So, uh, because we are developers here mostly, uh, and, uh, well, I would like to welcome new developers for our team. I would like to tell you a couple of things about the tools that we use. Uh, all of the stuff that we, that we do is written in Ruby. Uh, the front end is written in Ruby on Rails. We are using Postgres as our database running on top of CentOS or Fedora for the, for the, uh, for the community version of our, our thing. Uh, we are using, for example, Memcache. In our team, there's uh, quite a lot of developers contributing a to a bunch of different uh, projects, starting with Ruby on the top, Ruby on Rails, Patternfly, Bundle, and uh, many, many gems. Uh, because we have quite a big core base, then, then if you look at the contributions to Ruby or Ruby on Rails that are done by people in our team, those are basically, uh, basically performance-related things, such as make all the Ruby libraries using bundle a load faster, stuff like that. So uh, we are constantly hire, hiring. So I would, if any students are here, I would like to to invite you to to our to our internship programs. So we basically have like two rounds each each year. The main be, main being before the summer holidays. So and we have very. We have quite, quite, quite a few guys on our team who started as, as interns, and we would like to, let's say, carry on with this. Also, we, 
we can help you get your bachelor thesis, something like that, uh, on the product. So you might be working on something that actually gets uh, gets uh, used by by people in the real world. So that's it from me. I now would ask my colleague Milan to tell you about uh, Automate. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, my name is Milan Zazrivec. Uh, I'm also one of the uh, many JQ developers uh, based here in uh, Brno. And in the second part of this session, I'm going to be speaking of uh, speaking about uh, automation with Manage IQ, uh, what it can do, and uh, how it can make your life in cloud uh, easier. So, uh, what are the most uh, common uh, use cases for uh, automation in ManageIQ. Uh, ManageIQ can, for example, serve as, a, as an integration point uh, during uh, host or VM provisioning, meaning then that, for example, you can uh, customize your uh, provisioning process so that uh, before any uh, new virtual machine is deployed, it can request, for example, a new uh, IP address uh, from, uh, your some, from some management pool uh, file a ticket with a help desk, or well, you can integrate it pretty much with any uh, uh, business management uh, thing you can have in your company. Uh, you can customize your uh, infrastructure to do automatic power on off uh, based on your office hours. Uh, another interesting use case is uh, automatic uh, tagging based on the uh, content, on the file content uh, of your virtual machines. And uh, probably the most uh, interesting use case for uh, automation in Magic IQ is automating infrastructure scaling based on utilization. So, for example, you can have multiple hosts. One of them uh, is being loaded, uh, high CPU usage, storage, what have you. And uh, you can customize uh, the automation so that when this happens, uh, a new host is automatically added or uh, virtual machines from the loaded host can be automatically migrated to, to a new machine. Okay, so uh, let's start with the basics. Uh, the very basic building uh, block of Automation Manage IQ is Automation Data Store. So uh, this is what it looks like in, uh, in the UI. When you navigate to Automate uh, an Explorer, you're going to be presented with a tree structure that is the Automation Data Store. Uh, and uh, I'm going to briefly explain all the uh, important items that you can see here. So, uh, like I said, it's a tree-like structure, directory-like structure uh, with uh, items of several types, domains, namespaces, classes, insta instances, and methods. Uh, automation dom domain uh, is the top-level uh, folder, which contains, well, pretty much everything. And uh, important thing about uh, about this is that every new ManageIQ installation will will come with a default ManageIQ domain, which already contains all kinds of automated magic, uh, which you can use. Uh, the the default ManageIQ domain is uh, uh, read only; it's locked, so you cannot really modify it. But what you can do is you can create a copy of every automation method you like or instance class and uh, customize it in any way you want. So next item is uh, automation namespace. Uh, this is really uh, just uh, a container for everything else. And uh, you, you, you can model it in model it any, any way you want. And this is really just to have things nicely, nicely organized. Uh, automation class is, in fact, the most important component of uh, the Automation data store. This is, in fact, where all the magic happens. Every automation class is defined by, by its schema. Uh, this is where you say, okay, uh, this automation class is going to have uh, these methods, these attributes, these states, and uh, these relationships. 
automation class instance is nothing but an instance of the class you, de you defined previously for uh, the, your specific use case. So it, it is an instance with the actual fields uh, filled in. An automation method, finally, is uh, the actual code which is going to be executed when you run, run automation. This, in fact, is a Ruby code. Ruby code that you're going to have to write from scratch, or you can, like I said, you can uh, modify the existing, uh, existing code that we provide. So back to the screenshot uh, that I showed you before. The top level, uh, you can see the top level uh, domain, then a couple of namespaces, cloud, orchestration, VM, some classes, placement, naming, email. Uh, the placement class has, uh, in this example, has one, has got one uh, instance called default and uh, two methods, best fit Amazon, best fit OpenStack. Okay, uh, to show you how this works, uh, I'm gonna demonstrate this with a very simple hello world example. Not very realistic, but it will do. Uh, <laughs> this example does nothing more than it is going to print hello world into automation log. Automation log is a log file which lives on your uh, manage IQ server and it contains, uh, well, logs from automations. <laughs> Uh, so first, we we, ha we have to create a class schema. Uh, before that, I uh, created a new custom domain, example.com, under which I have uh, the simple stuff, uh, simple stuff uh, namespace, and uh, then I created a hello world class. Uh, on the right side, you can see that uh, that is actually the sch schema definition of the class. It says this class is going to have only one method. The placeholder name is called execute. Uh, next, we create class instance. Uh, on the right side, uh, it says, uh, in this instance of the class, we're going to use hello world method. The name of the me method we're going to use is hello world. So in the next step, we create a hello world method. That is the actual Ruby code that we're going to execute. It's very simple. It's just two-liner. First line is going to be the, the, the log line, hello world, and uh, then we exit. We're done. Uh, how do we run this stuff? So uh, the, the easiest way to run automation is uh, th through simulations. So uh, what you do in your UI, you navigate to automate and simulation. Uh, at the top, uh, you have to fill, fill in all kinds of magic, but this, uh, this stuff at the top basically says uh, simulation is going to create, in, create an instance of a class. Which class? That is that uh, specified uh, at the bottom. You say namespace, class, instance, you submit, and uh, uh, this is the result. This is the result in automation log. So you can see the hello world. Okay. So in the example I just showed you, you saw that uh, you could see that uh, I was using uh, this dollar EVM thing to log hello world into automation log. So what is this uh, dollar EVM thing? Uh, it is, uh, this EVM variable is, uh, is a way for Manage IQ Automation to uh, provide you access to the data that you're going to need during uh, the automation process. That is the data that came with the automation request uh, or from the automation event. And uh, this, uh, uh, this thing also will uh, provide you access to all the data in your manage IQ, da manage IQ database. So uh, uh, this dollar EVM thing, uh, it's quite complex. It has uh, lots of lots of uh, methods, and I'm not really gonna explain uh, this uh, too deeply because it's kind of boring, and uh, the thing is nicely documented in the manage IQ documentation. So I'm just gonna show some examples. This is how you log things. Info, warning, error. And this is how you, for example, will access the data in your database. So uh, dollar EVM root will contain uh, uh, the, will provide you access to your manage IQ database, to your virtual machines, users, requests, hosts, storages, clusters, etc. The content of the EVM root, in fact, will always depend on the type of uh, automation that you're running. So for example, if it's uh, VM related, you're going, going to work with EVM root VM. If it's host related, 
you're gonna you're gonna have EVM root host pre-filled <coughs> with the actual data. So uh, one uh, the first way of entering or triggering automation manage, in ManageIQ is uh, with simulation, uh, but uh, that's not really what you want to do. Uh, there are other ways of how you can uh, trigger the automation run. Uh, one is uh, through custom buttons, then through management policies, alerts, and uh, finally with REST API. So uh, next I'm going to show you how to, how to execute or how to customize your automa automation using custom buttons. So uh, one thing that you can do in ManageIQ UI is that you, you are, you're able to create all kinds of custom buttons for, for example, hosts, VMs, uh, clusters, etc. And these buttons will eventually show up somewhere in the UI. For example, if you create buttons for hosts, they will show up uh, in a tab where you, when you click on a, on a specific host. Uh, interesting thing about custom buttons is that you can attach all kinds of functionality to it. You can uh, attach a custom dialog to it so that, for example, you click on a button, uh, dialog is presented to you, you fill in some values, for example, name of a virtual, virtual machine, and uh, you can pass all kinds of other data, attributes and values uh, to the automation method that you want to execute. So, for example, one way to use custom buttons with automation is that you're going to have uh, one generic automation method, which, going to, which is going to take some uh, arguments, some parameters, and you're going to pass different parameters to this automation method with different buttons. Okay, a uh, simple example with custom buttons. So uh, in this example, uh, we're going to create uh, custom buttons for a, a VM host. And uh, what these buttons are going to do, they're going to delete idle machines. We're going to have three buttons. Uh, one is for machines which are idle more than seven days, uh, then for more than 14 days, and then for 30 days. Uh, so uh, what we're going to need, again, new class, instance, methods. Uh, next thing, uh, we are going to create new automation entry point, although this part is not really needed, but we're going to create anyway. And finally, the uh, custom buttons. So again, new class. Uh, I created a new class called idle VMS. Uh, on the right, it says there is going to be just one method. Uh, next, new instance. Uh, again, I incidentally, I na named it idle VMS. This instance is going to use idle underscore VMS method. And uh, finally, the interesting part, this is the Ruby code uh, that you're going to put in into your uh, idle underscore VMS method. This is where all the magic happens. So uh, the most interesting part or the most important part is uh, uh, the first, first line where you uh, collect the data that was passed to you from the custom button. This is how you do it, through EVM root. And uh, the, the other interesting part is uh, EVM root host. Uh, this will contain the object representing the VM host for which you uh, triggered the, the automation. So you clicked on a, on a specific host on, on, the, on the custom button that we created and uh, this is going to be the host. So uh, we go through through all its virtual machines. Uh, we look at the power state, if it's, if it's off, and uh, if it's been off for that many days, we just uh, add it to a list of uh, idle VMS. Next, we're going to create a ticket. Uh, we construct a body of, a, of an email, and finally, we're going to send an email to uh, to, well, help desk at example com. So in fact, we're not deleting the machines, we're just notifying uh, our help desk, okay, these machines need to be created. Finally, we, we exit with MIQ, okay, we're done. Uh, next, new entry point. Like I said, this part is not really needed. We can uh, execute this, uh, this uh, method the same way we did in simulation. Uh, but this is really just to make our life easier. Here we, on the right, we uh, created relation to, to the instance we created before. So this basically says whenever you enter automation through this entry point, you're going to instantiate this class. 
So uh, uh, as the last thing, we're, last thing we're, we're going to create the three custom buttons. First button for seven days, as you see here at the, bo at the bottom. Seven days. Another button for 14 days and uh, another button for 30 days. Uh, this is where the buttons will show the UI. So you navigate to the specific host and you uh, are presented with these three custom buttons. You click on it, magic happens. Okay, so uh, another way to uh, trigger automation event is uh, with uh, uh, control policy action and management alerts. It is pretty much the same way as with custom buttons, except that with custom buttons you have to go somewhere in the UI and click on something, click on some button for the magic to happen. With uh, control policy actions, something magical has to happen in your cloud infrastructure. For example, uh, new VM is started, uh, VM is cloned, uh, VM host is. Uh, running out of space, something like that, some event has to happen, and uh, the manage IQ server will catch this, and uh, uh, you can customize the automation so that whenever this happens, automation happens. So, for example, the uh, VM host is loaded, you can customize the automation so that new host is added, or VMs from the loaded host are migrated somewhere else. And finally, uh, uh, state machines. Uh, uh, in the examples that I showed you uh, today, uh, all the automation uh, stuff was really just one Ruby method. It will do. It's very simple. But in the real, real life, uh, the real life is more, more complex. And uh, what you really want to do in real life is for the automation run to be a sequence of steps or states. So what the uh, automation schema allows you to do is to define a bunch of states in your, in your class. And uh, with the automation method, you will define transitions between these states. So effectively, what you're modeling is a state machine. So the, exit, so the automation run is, run is a sequence of steps. And with st state, state machine, what you can do, you can make sure that uh, each step is successfully completed before next step can continue. Or you can, for example, uh, retry the step that failed. Or you can, for example, uh, set a timeout on a successful completion of, of a state. But otherwise, uh, things are the same. You can trigger it with either, either a button, simulation, or a, a custom action, or a REST API, of course. Uh, yeah, so uh, the default manage IQ automation schema, come, uh, the, the, the automation data store comes with all kinds of state machines already predefined, uh, host, VM, instance provisioning, retirement, etc., uh, VM migration. So uh, the most commonly used is the VM provisioning, and uh, this is... Uh, like I said, by default, you cannot modify the, the default automation code but, code, but what you can do, you can copy it out, your own domain, and you can customize the VM provisioning in any way you like. Okay. Questions for me or my colleagues? Do we plan to enable versioning? versioning? Yeah, because we're writing code in <coughs> browser that was latent. We are not sending. Writing a code in. I know what it is. Okay, you know what it is. Okay. Uh, yes, actually, there's a JIT integration already in place, so so you can have your you can have your methods exported as JIT repo, and you can work with Vim or whatever tooling you use and use JIT. No. Is there a way how Manage AQ might uh, help me with migration of my like applications and data from one cloud provider to another cloud provider? Like if I would like, for example, to migrate 
application and data from uh, Google Cloud Engine to OpenShift or something. So is there anything I can do? Uh, yeah, so the question was if uh, if uh, ManageIQ somehow helps you to migrate your stuff from uh, one, one cloud provider to another or let's say from uh, infra to cloud or from cloud to infra, something like that. And the answer is yes, it's quite a commonly used use case but our, by our customers. Well, it's not like clicky clicky, but uh, well, you have to use the Red Hat uh, engineering services. So consultancy services, something like that, I don't know the name, and they will create it for you and uh, prepare it uh, so that then you have such a custom button and that you cl click that and magic happens. Unfortunately, we are out of time. If you would like to ask something, you can do it outside of this room. So, sorry. So, thank you.